A local monk named Ermentarius describes the Viking onslaught and devastation that continues for decades along the Seine and Loire rivers and beyond. The number of ships grows, he writes. The endless stream of Vikings never ceases to increase. Everywhere, the Christians are the victims of massacres, burnings, plunderings. The Vikings conquer all in their path, and nothing resists them. When the large Viking fleet sails down the Seine River and proceeds on Paris, this huge town that is well defended, the king, the king of France, who is residing in Paris, chooses instead of facing them. And the possible destruction that could come from facing the Vikings actually decides to buy them off. The king of France, Charles the Bald, pays Ragnar nearly six tons of silver and gold bullion so the raiders would leave and never come back. It has the opposite effect. As word spreads that such loot and tribute can be had, that land and goods are everywhere, the pillaging of northern Europe and the continent continues with fervor. Between 790 and 1100 AD, Vikings follow every major river and water route into the heart of the continent. For the Vikings, a new world awaits. Norwegians write perhaps the most colorful chapter in Viking history as fearless explorers as they colonize Iceland, Greenland, and beyond. With the colonization of Greenland comes the story of two legendary Norwegian Vikings, Eric the Red and his son, Leif Erikson. In the late 900s, Eric leads an expedition here and becomes the first to settle this unforgiving land. A fiery character, Eric is soon banished for three years from Iceland as well. He sails west and settles on the east coast of Greenland. And so he begins to advertise this land, and he can't very well say, by the way, we only have a little bit of coastline that is at all habitable. So he goes over and says, we've got Greenland. It's covered in green. Some of them undoubtedly come, see what it is, is really like, and go home. But a lot of very strong and stalwart and hardy Vikings stay, and they have a life that is very harsh. The ground wasn't very tillable, but fishing was available, and other uh, meat was available. But it was a harsh land. During Eric the Red's leadership, a Norse agrarian society scratches a living in this distant land. For government, the villagers convene an all thing, a kind of public assembly or court of law transplanted from their homelands. Here, free men have the right to speak in their defense and on issues of community concern. From this community of free men comes Eric the Red's son, Leif Erikson. Like his father, he yearns to explore. In the year 1000, he sets sail. Leif Erikson follows a rumor, another Viking before him has left an account that he was traveling to the west by to go to the other colony in, in Greenland and gets blown off course. And by the time he has found his direction, he's off the coast of a very green and luscious land. Well, Greenland was not green, nor was it luscious. By following the rumors of an unknown land to the west, Leif Erikson discovers a new world. This is a fascinating thing and still very, uh, very controversial in a way. Uh, I personally believe that uh, America was, was discovered by, um, by the Vikings uh, in, in or about the year 1000. Leif Erikson's uh, village in, uh, in Newfoundland has been carbon dated, for example, 
precisely to the year 1000 AD. So we know that that Vikings were at least in Newfoundland and probably uh, farther to the, to the south than that. The Greenlanders' attempt to settle here fail. It's estimated that Newfoundland colony lasts only a decade. And yet, 500 years before Columbus would make his epic journey, Vikings link the eastern and western hemisphere. After wintering in Newfoundland, Leif Erikson returns to Greenland. He introduces something new to the island settlers. With the same tools that build the longships, they build the rugged crosses of a new religion. They decided that they would convert. Leif Erikson went to Norway where the king uh, asked him specifically to take Christianity to Greenland and to Christianize Greenland uh, colonies, which he dutifully did. As Viking influence spreads, the wider world shapes the Vikings. Their leaders see Christianity as a means to unite the Vikings and ultimately to wield more control over them. At the dawn of the 11th century, 200 years after the attack at Lindisfarne, the Norse people still have no single king and little sense of solidarity. So it is Christianity that presents a reason to unite. But the Christian Vikings sometimes find resistance from their pagan tribesmen, a resistance to give up their ancient gods. The kings began to go for Christianity because it helped them. It helped them consolidate power. And they began to impose it on these people. And there was a lot of struggle. The, the people didn't like it. They didn't want to give up their old ways. They were afraid of giving up their old ways. There were some Christian missionaries that came on uh, the island and went around and converted a few. But there were a lot of skeptics. And at one certain occasion, they decided that they were going to go into a test against the pagan deities and the representative of the pagan deities, which was known as a berserker, a man who was a little crazy, to put it nicely. And so these Christian missionaries challenged him. So said, we'll build a fire, and you pagans build a fire. If the berserker passes through your fire but can't pass through ours, then we know Christianity is one. If he can't pass through yours, then we know paganism is one. It's almost like an Old Testament duel. Well, the story says that the Viking berserker came in, passed easily over the fire that was made by the pagans, but could not penetrate the fire that was made by Christians. And thus, everyone around saw that Christianity was the right religion and thus joined. Back in Norway, the great catalyst for Viking unity will emerge in the destiny of one young Viking boy. Harald Hardrada is the half-brother of Norway's King Olaf and his heir apparent. He is just 15 years old, fighting on the losing side of a Viking civil war. But Harald will return. He will have his revenge. And he will write his own history in the blood of his enemies. The Vikings spread like a murderous plague across the face of Europe. The first to fall are unarmed monasteries. But soon, the invaders bring terror even deeper into the continent. Eventually, the Vikings turn upon themselves. Norway is locked in civil war. In the year 1030, the Battle of Stiklestad pits forces loyal to current Danish ruler Knut the Great against Norwegian King Olaf. From the ashes of the infighting that bloody Norway's soil and soul, a young warrior has risen, Harald Hardrada, King Olaf's half-brother and heir. In the middle of the 11th century, as Harald grows to manhood, he will develop the ambition to lead and unite Norway. But first he must gain the power to do so. Harold was an interesting character. He begins his Viking regime, if you will, when he's a young man. 
At 16, he's wounded in a battle that will eventually take his royal brother's life, and he is forced to flee. Harold Hardrada faces exile in the faraway northern lands. He heads to Sweden, then eventually to Kiev, a thriving trading city in what is now the Ukraine. In 1031, he follows the route of the Swedish Vikings, who established trading centers during the previous two centuries to access exotic Eastern goods. The Swedes came as violent raiders, but stayed to become cosmopolitan traders. Through trade, Kiev connects the Norse world with the wider world of the East, a point that is not lost on Harold. Um, when they find coin hoards of this period, the coins are from all over the world. And they, f they found like little statues of Buddha in the ruins of Hedeby. And it's, uh, these were the, the connections of these people. They were, they're far more important because of this than because of the Basham Smasham stuff. It is at this intersection of culture and trade, Harold realizes that without a market for his plunder, his power is limited. It's a lesson he'll soon put to use. The Vikings had lived on trade for hundreds of years. When you go out there and you trash a monastery and you grab a bunch of cups and some manuscripts, you're not going to take them home. You know, what, what use are they to you? You have to go someplace and swap them for what you really want. But material goods make up only part of the trading. The Vikings are also dealers in human flesh. As slave masters, they trade the men and women captured by their raiding parties. Women died in those days at an appalling rate in childbirth, so you had a constant resupply with women. And they would seize the girls and carry them off and undoubtedly rape them and then take them to slave pens and sell them off. But despite Kiev's economic lessons, Harold has not come this far only to seek his fortune in the marketplace. The heart of a Viking beats strongly in him. He must also assume the mantle of a warrior and learn the skills that will make him a king. By the year 1038, Harold has grown confident and hungry for plunder. He is now leader of an elite force of Viking mercenaries. He battles insurrection on behalf of foreign rulers across the east, garnering wealth and power as he prepares to return to Norway and seize the crown. In Sicily, Harold demonstrates his legendary resourcefulness. Harold's uh, generalship is characterized not necessarily by great courage, but by great slyness. And this is a major Viking uh, virtue, is rather than go and just bash people over the head, if you can be sneaky, you know, they prefer that. Uh, one of his tactics was at, they, they came to a city and they besieged the city and, and he had his men capture the little birds that were flying in and out of the city. And with pitch and string, they attached little burning twigs to the backs of the birds and let them go. The birds flew back into the city to their nests in the thatch and immediately started the city on fire, so they took the city. In King Harold's saga, 13th century Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson writes of the plan's effectiveness in conquering Sicily. At that, all the people came out of the town begging for mercy, he writes. The very same people who had been shouting defiant insults at the army and its leader for days on end. Harold spared the lives of all those who begged for quarter and took control of the town. After nearly 15 years, the cunning Harold amasses the reputation and wealth he needs to at last lay rightful claim to his fractured native land. In 1046, he heads back to Scandinavia, a famous mercenary with the riches and ambition of a king, but without the title. Thank you.